Hello, this is Professor James Strickler. This is a course in American government. This lesson is from Unit 4 about the legislative branch. And it's Lesson 8 about the process that the Senate goes through in passing legislation. In this lesson, you'll learn about unlimited amendments, unlimited debate, the filibuster, cloture, and unanimous consent. In previous lessons, we've been working out this diagram of the legislative process. It looks very complicated, but we've been explaining it step by step. Now, please remember that the goal of this legislative process is to eventually create a law. To create that law, we have to get it approved by both the United States House and the United States Senate. They then are considered by the entire floor in whichever chamber they're in at that moment. Eventually, after floor consideration, if a bill uh, passes, it is then sent to the other house to be considered. So a bill beginning in the house, if it manages to work all the way through the process and eventually be approved on the floor by a majority, it's sent over to the Senate to be approved. Similarly, if a bill manages to work its way all the way through the process in the Senate, it's sent to the House to be approved. But as a bill works its way through both of these chambers, inevitably it ends up slightly different. And so that necessitates a conference committee with a few people from each chamber to try to work out a compromise version. That conference committee then takes the two incompatible versions from the House and the Senate works out a compromise version and then sends it back to both the House and the Senate to be voted on by them. In this lesson, we will now consider what happens in the Senate during the floor consideration stage. Now, we developed the whole process to this point in the previous lesson as we discussed floor consideration in the House. But as we began talking about floor consideration in the House, we were reminded that uh, things are different in the Senate, so we need to talk about that separately. Things are different in the Senate because the United States Constitution says each House can set its own rules for its proceedings. And with the Senate composed very differently from the House, with people who serve there longer, and a smaller number of them, it's created a very different set of rules. So now let's look at floor consideration in the United States Senate where, as with the House, the eventual purpose of floor consideration is to get a vote. That's what you see in the, going on in the background of this slide, is members of the United States Senate actually voting on a bill. Floor consideration in the House is very, excuse me, in the Senate is very different than floor consideration in the House, because you don't have a rules committee that sets restrictions, first of all, on what kind of amendments can be proposed to a given bill. Instead, generally speaking, in the Senate, there's an opportunity for members of the Senate to uh, propose any amendment that they want and then get it voted on and decide whether their fellow senators actually want to make that change. Also, in the Senate, rather than having a, a strict time limit to how long a particular bill can be debated, there's unlimited debate. As long as the senators want to keep talking about a bill, they can continue to do so. Now that unlimited debate allowed in the Senate creates the possibility of what's known as the filibuster. If you've ever heard of a filibuster before, it may well be because you're a fan of classic movies. One of the great classic movies is a film called Mr. Smith Goes to Washington that has a fictionalized filibuster in it. That's where most people, if they know about filibuster, have heard, from, heard it from. A filibuster is a prolonged speech given on the floor of the United States Senate. The purpose of that long speech is to obstruct the legislation that's being considered. Now, the way this works essentially is because there's unlimited debate and people can talk as long as they want, a member of the Senate who gets the floor can keep talking and talking and talking and talking to the point of not just annoyance of his colleagues, but with the goal of the colleagues eventually saying, essentially, look, if you'll just sit down and shut up so we can move on to other things, 
we will agree to take the bill that you're talking about endlessly off our agenda. So that's why filibusters are staged, to try to force the other members of the Senate to uh, stop considering that bill, basically throw it in the trash. So filibusters are staged by people who oppose a particular bill and want to stop it. And they try to stop it by debating it to death. If somebody wants to stage a filibuster, there's a small number of rules that they have to follow. The first of those is while they hold the floor, they have to actually keep talking. Now, there's no rule about what they have to be saying. Uh, there's past instances in filibusters of members of the Senate simply reading names out of the phone book or reading from the Bible. A famous example in the past few years was a member of the Senate who was engaged in a filibuster when it was bedtime for his little children at home. So he read them a bedtime story over the TV, which was covering the filibuster. Senator Ted Cruz from Texas read his daughters the story Green Eggs and Ham. Doesn't matter what this person staging the filibuster is saying, as long as they keep talking. They also have to stay standing. If they get too tired and have to sit down, they then lose the floor. And if the Senate then wants to end the debate because no one else wants to talk, they can do so. Finally, they have to not leave the room. Once they get the floor and start talking, they have to stay in the room and keep talking. Now, even with those restrictions in place, the record for the longest filibuster staged by a single person was Senator Strom Thurmond, a senator from South Carolina who filibustered the Civil Rights Act of 1957, which he wanted to stop. He kept his filibuster going for over 24 hours, but eventually he gave up and quit, and the Civil Rights Act was passed anyway, despite his objections. For a filibuster to really work, it can't just be one person trying to stop something, because eventually they'll get too tired and have to give in. For it to really work, that you need a team of people who are trying to filibuster. So that as one gets tired, he can yield the floor to a fellow senator that's on his side of the issue and go take a nap while that person is talking, get something to eat, use the bathroom, and then they can switch places. Senator Strom Thurmond, who knew he was going it alone, actually went to the sauna the day before and intentionally dehydrated himself so he wouldn't have to urinate while he was up there talking and would never have to leave the room. There is a way to end a filibuster, though, even if it's well staged by a team of people that can keep each other going by giving each other breaks. The way to stop a filibuster is a cloture vote. A cloture vote, however, requires 60 senators vote to approve it. This is a supermajority of the United States Senate. Remember, there are 100 senators. So this isn't just a simple majority of 50 plus 1. Instead, it's a supermajority. Three-fifths of the Senate is needed to vote, to invoke cloture, to stop a person from talking, and be able to move on to eventually vote on a bill. Now, the problem with this 60-vote uh, threshold for cloture is hardly ever does one political party have 60 votes in the Senate. Currently, the Republicans who control the Senate have 54 seats while the Democrats have only 44. What this means is, is that the Republicans can never really stop a filibuster. If the 44 Democrats are united to pull off a filibuster, then not only can they take turns talking, but the 54 Republicans, if they try to invoke cloture and the Democrats stick together, can never get the 60 votes that they need. What this means is a practical matter, if we go back to this diagram you saw earlier in the course of leadership in the Senate, is that the majority leader and the minority leader have to actually work together to get anything done. Because the majority leader never has enough votes on his own to act, get any legislation that, that he wants passed just because he wants it. This makes the process of legislating in the Senate very different from the House of Representatives. Remember we talked about the House of Representatives because everything's done on a simple majority basis. If the Speaker of the House, who's the leader of the majority party, can keep all the members of his party united, he can simply outvote 
the other political party on everything and win and not care what they think. But in the Senate, because of the 60 vote threshold for cloture and the fact that the majority party hardly ever has 60 votes, that means to move legislation through that is controversial and possibly going to be subject to filibuster, they're going to need a little bit of help from the other side. They're going to have to have some cooperation between the political parties to get things done. As a consequence, the, the Senate majority leader and the Senate minority leader are forced to work together. Here we have a picture of the two men that are currently in those positions in the United States Senate. Mitch McConnell's on the right, he's the Senate majority leader, and Harry Reid is the Senate minority leader on the left. Now, they may not personally like each other, but because of the way business is done in the Senate, they are forced to work together. And the way that they most efficiently work, to get, work together is through what are called unanimous consent agreements. Now, a unanimous consent agreement is an agreement between the leadership where they won't go through the process of debate and amendment on a particular bill. Instead, somebody will simply stand up and say, I ask unanimous consent that this particular law be passed. Because the leaders on their own have agreed to it, they've decided that they're both okay with whatever it is, they then can try to organize the members of their political parties to go along with it. A difficulty, though, is that if any senator stands up and objects to a unanimous consent agreement, then unanimous consent fails. That's what it means, is that everybody has to agree to it. So while the leaders may have come to their own agreement that this particular proposed law is fine and both political parties should vote for it, if any single senator doesn't like it, he can stop it. That act of a senator threatening to hold up a piece of legislation by objecting to it is called a hold. And this is how unanimous consent is usually prevented. The leadership doesn't want to be embarrassed by asking unanimous consent for something than someone standing up and saying, I object. So before they ever ask for your unanimous consent, they send out their whips to check with all the members of their party to find out if they're going to object or not. And if the particular senator says, yes, if you ask unanimous consent on something, on this particular thing, I'm going to object. That then creates a hold this uh, unofficial limbo that the uh, proposed bill is put in. The leadership can then go talk to this person and try to work out uh, some sort of compromise with them for them to remove their hold where they won't prevent unanimous consent anymore. Or they may simply have to go through the regular process of uh, debating and amending and calling for a cloture vote, etc., to get the law passed. Okay, now let's re review what we learned in this lesson about the process of the Senate creating legislation. Who sets limits on debate in the Senate? Does the president pro tempore set the limits? Does the majority set leader set the limits? Does the Senate Rules Committee set the limits? Or are there no limits on debates in the Senate? There are no limits on debate in the United States Senate. Well, unless cloture is eventually invoked. If it's not, they can keep debating forever if they wanted to. What is a filibuster? Is it a prolonged speech to stop a bill? A vote to end debate? A way to pass a law without actually voting on it? Or is it a way of forcing a bill to a vote? A filibuster is a prolonged speech designed to stop a bill from being passed. How can debate be stopped in the Senate? Is it stopped because the Senate rules set a time limit? Is it stopped by a simple majority vote? Is it stopped by a cloture vote of 60 senators? Or is it stopped because the majority leader simply decides to stop it? Debate in the Senate has to be stopped by a cloture vote of 60 senators. What is a hold? Is it a unanimous consent agreement? Is it an objection to a unanimous consent agreement? Or is it just a threat to object to 
to a unanimous consent agreement? Or is it approval of unanimous consent? A hold is simply the threat to object. Okay, that completes this lesson about the process that the Senate goes through when legislating. Our next lesson from Unit 4 will be Lesson 9 about the executive process. In other words, how the executive is involved in creating laws.